Join me now as we discover the identity and background of the principal villain of season four using the Lichdom game today on Me, Myself and I. Hello everyone and welcome back once again to Me, Myself and I. I am as always your humble GM, host and player Trevor DeVal. Thank you so much for joining me here today. And if you do want to help support the show, please do consider joining us over on Patreon or here on YouTube and becoming a uh, channel member. Uh, that really helps the channel out a lot. Today we're going to do something pretty cool. I decided I wanted to determine the villain before anything else when it comes to what's going to come in Season 4. And I thought the best way to do that is to make the villain a lich. Because of course, it's gotta have a lich. Gotta, gotta be a lich, right? Gotta be a lich. And just by wonderful coincidence, I happen to have this game called Lichdom, which was sent to me by its author about a year ago. This first chance I've had to take a look at it. But this game is basically, uh, it's kind of like a journaling game, a story game, role-playing light kind of thing, uh, where basically you tell the emergent story of a sorcerer who's trying to ascend to lichdom or godhood if they get really lucky and i thought what a great tool to use to to play through to see what our villain of season four is actually going to wind up looking like so that is pretty cool but before we get into this at all i do want to determine the name of the villain and to do that i'm going to go to the raging swan press gm's miscellany dungeon dressing system neutral resource and i'm going to go all the way up to the dungeon names because there's some really cool names here. So I'm going to roll a prefix and I'm going to roll the main name and we'll see if anything cool comes up. So what do we got here? 51 on the prefix table is Mott, M-O-T. And then let's do the other one, 87 down here. Mott Zaroth. Oh, that's kind of cool. Mott Zaroth. <laughs> okay. Very, very cool. I'm going to keep this handy. I'm also going to keep the Mythic Game Master Emulator 2nd Edition handy, just in case I want a little extra details or inspiration or anything like that. So the first thing we do is we determine a little bit about who this sorcerer is in the Seeds of Ambition section. So how did you become a sorcerer? I'm going to roll a handy dandy D3 here and see what comes up. One, my arrogant old master taught me with pain. But I took my revenge after thanking him for the cruel lessons. That sounds appropriately litchy. I destroyed him. Destroyed, killed, banished to the outer darkness, who knows? What happened to your family? Another one. Some still live, but they are ashamed of what I have become. What early memory will stay with you forever? Two. The unbearable thirst while crossing the red wastes where demons abound and the scarce vegetation is carnivorous. Ooh, the red wastes, I may need to add that to the world. Which, by the way, I've decided on a name for. The name of this world is, thanks to a Patreon poll, thanks for everybody who uh, participated, The Broken Empires. That is the name of the world in which me, myself, and I takes place. And now there's a place called the Red Wastes. Huzzah. Where do you currently live? This is a big one. One, as the advisor of a noble lord or a tribal chief whom I manipulate to my advantage. This is the Lich as a sorcerer. So this is where this character begins at the beginning of this game, where he ends up, will hopefully be as the antagonist of season four. I'm imagining that this character exists in a cultural area that is quite different than anything we've seen on the show before. So I'm sort of imagining kind of like a desert setting, almost like a an Arabian-ish kind of setting, maybe. Uh, that might be cool. Something a little more sword and sorcery, like the city of Shadazar in, in the Conan lore. Something like that, I'm thinking. So I think that our guy, Motzaroth, is the advisor to um like a vizier or something like that. The vizier of... What's the name of the city? Uh, what's something appropriately Arabic sounding? Ah, well, let's go to Mythic Emulator and come up with a name. Ah, uh, An, A-N, 77, Ansha, An, An Sharir. I like that, An Sharir. So that is a city at the edge of a great desert. What are we gonna call it? The, I don't know, the, the Red Wastes, the Red Wastes. How do you look? How do you look? Three, furs protect me from the cold of the night, bones carved with runes hang from my hair, and the smell of smoke permeates my ragged clothes. Wow, kind of tribal. Smell of smoke and rotting meat. 
Who was your worst enemy? Who is your worst enemy? Who was it before? And how did you destroy them? Let's have a look here. This tells us a lot. My old friend, almost a brother, who shared my passion for mastering the arcane. We became enemies due to our very different opinions about the purpose of magic and the limits of morality. Great, so that tells me that this guy might have a moral center still swimming around in his blackened heart at some point. Interesting. What is the old friend's name, and is that old friend still alive? That's actually a good question. S. Esfer. Esferen. It was his name. Why do you look for immortality? Ah, the old question. Why? Why, Lich? Why? One. The short span of a mortal life is not enough to uncover the most incredible secrets of the cosmos. So here's how this works. There's this handy dandy Doom deck. It's a standard deck of cards, except this particular deck was specifically made for Lichdom, so. Check that out in the uh, link below over at DriveThruRPG if you uh, pick it up through there, uh, through my affiliate link, then that also is a good way to help support the channel. Anyway, the goal of this game is as you go through, you're gonna draw a, a card, and that card is going to become an event that the character has to deal with, or maybe just a descriptive event to help you sort of formulate the story of this character. But uh, what you're looking for are aces, because aces represent truths, the truths of the cosmos, because only by attaining both mundane and arcane truths of the cosmos can you ascend to lichdom. The more truths you uncover, the better the chance you have of becoming a lich. So. Let's look at the character sheet here. Resolve and Doom. Resolve is a measure of how far you are from your downfall. It increases when you succeed at adversities, but decreases when you fail at adversities or suffer catastrophes. You start the game with four resolve and lose the game when you reach zero resolve. The Doom represents the descent into darkness of the sorcerer. It increases when you suffer catastrophes or use corrupting powers. You can basically call upon corrupting powers to force a reroll. And if you do that though, it gives you a doom card which lowers your total amount of resolve you can get. It acts as sort of a, a ceiling for the, uh, for the resolve. Corrupting powers are extremely powerful but vile spells and rituals that are seldom used as the cost is always great on your soul. But you can use them and if you do, you can repeat an adversity challenge at the cost of increasing one doom using the same modifiers as the initial roll. This is a desperate race against time because as events occur, it might get more difficult to achieve your goals. You want to achieve your goals before you die, obviously, <laughs> or, or worse. So I'm looking for those truths. Each turn, you draw a card from the deck of doom to face the next event in your story or to find out what resources become available from engaging in an unscrupulous schemes and foul rituals. The meaning of each card is all in this book here. Essentially, as we go through, we're gonna be free associating things. We're gonna be shaping the events of the world and the character, all that kind of stuff uh, as we go. So a lot of uh, free sort of uh, creative exploration. However, there are dice rolls and there are uh, specific rules with each card, which we will deal with as we go. Each turn loosely represents a year in the life of the sorcerer, but not necessarily. That all depends on the context. There are two different types of cards. There's mundane and arcane. Mundane events represent social events or violent events, and the arcane cards represent research events or unnatural events. The goal is to find fundamental truths, one arcane and one mundane, at least. Much better to have more, total of four. Each card has a different meaning and a different interpretation. Let's just find out what happens. What is the first thing in Mot Zaroth's life that becomes of importance? We know that he killed his master, that his family is still alive, but ashamed of what he has become. His big memory is crossing the Red Wastes. Probably after he killed his master, he crossed the Red Wastes to the city of Ansharir, where he became an advisor to a noble lord, one of the, the vizier. He wears furs and runic bones and the smell of smoke is on him. So he come, his master was sort of a tribal shaman, I think, um, and he killed him. Uh, but he, has, uh, he had a friend, um, Esfaran, who was a, a fellow sorcerer in the city of Ansharir. And they were very, very good friends, almost like brothers. But one day they quarreled over the morality, over pursuing the secrets of the cosmos. Esferon believed that 
the power should be used for good to further the the needs and and desires of of good people however uh Mot-Zaroth, no he he disagreed he believed that the power of the cosmos was for sorcerers alone to use as they see fit and they quarreled and Mot Zaroth banished his friend Esferan into the outer darkness perhaps perhaps don't know want to keep that thread alive we'll see so that is where the character starts now what is the first event as we draw our first event card it is adversity arcane adversity the eight of clubs while learning a new spell or ritual either a mistake or a purposefully placed error in your source of sorcerous knowledge causes an unexpected and dangerous magical mishap that you only barely manage to control. How do you control the mishap and what does it cost you? Who is to blame for this failure? And what, of course, is the sorcerous mishap that occurs? Now, we should know that this is an adversity, which means it's a significant challenge in the life of the sorcerer. I have to roll 2d6 against the adversity difficulty, which is eight, add bonuses and penalties as applicable, and then discard the card. What is the sorcerous mishap that occurs? Three. A vortex of chaos and insanity grows and expands in the room like a festering wound with the will to consume the world. What sorcery were you performing? Two, a spell learned from the notes of an ascetic monk you found petrified. This is all cool. So let us see what happens. Now, right now with this adversity challenge, I have no companions or influence or enemies, things that are gonna affect the role. I just have my 2d6. I do have access, of course, to um, corrupting powers if this doesn't go well. I gotta roll 2d6 and I, I gotta get eight or more. Seven, that's not quite enough. Oh, we're off to a terrible start already. If you roll below the adversity level, you fail. You decrease your resolve by one. And of course, if you reach zero resolve, you lose the game. Now I could call upon corrupting powers to repeat this challenge, but I don't think it's worth it at this point. It's too much of a risk. So boom, I take. My first resolve damage. Motsaroth had found, he was, he was going through an ancient tomb complex buried in the desert, I think. And there was a, it was a, a temple, an old temple. There was a group of ancient ascetic monks that were in quiet contemplation of the universe, trying to unlock some of the secrets. And some of those monks, it is said, had uncovered certain truths and, and powers. And so Motsaroth had led an expedition to the tombs, he had uncovered some of the spells and he greedily took some of that, that information back to his tower where alone in the tower, he tried to cast a spell, but little did he know that the monks had laid a careful arcane trap on anyone who would dare to use this power for something other than its intended purposes. And what it did was cause a massive vortex of chaos and insanity to burst out of the tower. That will have consequences. I think in this case, the consequences will be determined by the draw of the next card. Oh, a scrying, arcane scrying. This is really cool. They represent special opportunities for your sorcerer to change future events through mundane scheming, or in this case, arcane scrying. You keep the card to use whenever you wish, but only after completing an event and before drawing the next card. You must also pay the cost of scrying with one of the following, discard another scheming or scrying card, or discard an influence card, which we don't have, or spend a resolve or gain one doom. I could use this right now, but it would cost me, in this case, a resolve or a doom, and I don't want to do that. So I'm going to keep this separate for now. This is a, a really, really powerful card, as you will see. How it manifests narratively, the Six of Clubs. By extensive and careful research in ancient tomes of sorcery, reading the shapes revealed in the smoke of a sacrifice, making abhorrent deals in the dark with powerful demons, or by any other unfathomable arcane means, I just figured out what happened uh, with that swirling vortex of chaos that he caused in his own tower. You are able to discern your destiny from the entanglement of multiple realities other mortals call future. It means that in the swirling vortex of chaos that appeared in the ritual gone wrong in Mozart's tower, something emerged from the swirling vortex and it was a demon of the outer planes. It was a demon of the outer realms. The demon that emerged from that vortex <laughs> has some description here, which is actually a great little table in this book. So let us figure this out. This is so cool. Its name was Satubel. I like that. Satubel 
the rotting. Oh, oh, so cool. Its appearance was a half serpent. It is known as the Lord of Hate and Discord. And as it turned out, Motzeroth made a deal, a bargain with the demon. He basically tricked the demon into believing that he had summoned the demon forth himself and on purpose, intending to free the demon to roam the world. That was the only way that Motzeroth knew that he would survive the encounter. And in exchange for its freedom, the demon offered Motzeroth one glimpse of prophecy. And with that, the demon fled the tower, causing and wreaking unspeakable havoc and chaos within the city of Asharir at the edge of the Red Wastes. But that was okay with Motzeroth because he got the gift of prophecy, which he can use later. I think some time goes by, a year goes by. And what happens? Mundane plot. Mundane plots work against you, such as a conspiracy to end your life or enemy petitions to responsive gods to halt your progress and thwart your ambitions. Keep the card visible on the table. The next time you have to roll a challenge of the same nature, so the next time I have to roll a mundane challenge, apply a penalty of minus two and discard the card. So basically, whatever mundane challenge I next meet, this plot comes into effect. I can't scry yet because I don't want to take any damage and I don't I, I don't have any further influence that I can spend, uh, bend. So, um, whatever happens, again, I don't know the details of this, so I think that there are mundane enemies plotting against Matsaroth, perhaps enemies that know that he was responsible for releasing the demon into the city. As much as he tried to keep that secret, I think maybe there were some, uh, maybe other members of the vizier's court that knew that he was responsible for this and are now plotting against him. Cool. What is next in Mozart's story? An event, an arcane event. So these are purely descriptive events. Your search of forgotten lore in ancient ruins and dusty tomes takes you to communicating with elder gods long forgotten by other mortals. You hear their calling in the heavy darkness on the darkest nights, cold whispers in an unknown language older than time itself, uttering unfathomable truths and making terrible demands from their mortal worshippers. So let us determine who it is that speaks to me, ancient forgotten gods, speaking out of strange aeons. Azathoth, ha! Convenient that it was strange aeons. Azathoth, the sleeping god beyond the veil, whose dreams manifest as horrifying reality. I believe Azathoth is in the public domain, so I can use that. <laughs> The spell that he uncovered in the desert from the group of ascetic monks, they were divinely inspired. They thought that they were quietly contemplating and, and coming up with this sort of understanding of magic through their own quiet contemplation. But in fact, it turns out that they were slowly and secretly being inspired from beyond the veil by Azathoth, the sleeping god, who in fact was twisting their knowledge and twisting their magic to cause horrible things to happen. So, as it turns out, when the swirling vortex of chaos manifested in Matzaroth's tower, it wasn't because the ascetic monks had set a trap, no. It was just a result of Azathoth's twisting of magical energies, and when Matzaroth figured this out, he knew he had to make contact, and contact he did eventually make. I think that Azathoth, Azathoth taught Matzaroth how to harness the magical powers of dreams. But in exchange, Motzeroth had to establish a, a cult to Azathoth somewhere in the city. Let's get a name of those monks. Military, so the sword or the staff or the spear. Well, we'll stick with military actually. We'll, we'll call them the monks of the staff. Petrified staff, that's kind of cool. I got that because the description of the ascetic monk uh, was petrified, so maybe there's a connection there, or maybe not, but you know what? That sounds cool. What is next in the events of Mozaroth? Another event, a mundane event. The bloodthirsty heir of an old ruling dynasty has come to power by treachery and murder, and you helped or failed to prevent it. Discontent spreads and revolution is imminent, but the iron fist of the new ruler keeps the population in check with ruthless practices and well-paid mercenaries while the coffers of the kingdom are wasted in bribes and steel. What is the name? What are the elements of the name of this person? 72, we could play fast and loose with this. Ra, R-A-H, Ra 80, 
Ratal. Ratal, sure, who had the support of other noble dynasties and declared the rightful ruler an outlaw, so he deposed the vizier. I think it stands to reason that if Mozaroth saw a new power rising, he would either try and destroy it if he could, which he can't yet, because he's not that powerful, or side with it and make the best of it. So I think that's what he did. He did in fact help, oh yeah, he betrayed the vizier uh, because he was an advisor. He was a close personal advisor to the vizier, but he saw his opportunity. And so when Ratal came to power, Mozaroth knew that the best way to secure his own power was to work with Ratal to get rid of the vizier. So in fact, he he opened the doors, he opened the gates to the palace, basically allowing Ratal's men to enter uh, the palace and, you know, butcher the guards, maybe some of the vizier's family. The vizier was forced to flee. And I think that he promised Ratal sorceress advice, sorceress aid in exchange for a step up in rank, because I think that um, the the previous vizier looked upon uh, Mozaroth as sort of like still kind of like a tribal because of where he came from. He was just he was always just some sort of low shaman. But I think that by the time that Ratal comes to power, uh, Mozaroth has made himself uh, quite grand in terms of his presentation of himself. He's ditched the rune carved bones and the animal furs and things like this. Now he wears elegant you know, gowns and robes and his fingers bedecked in jeweled rings, things of this nature. And I think that uh, he always resented the vizier for, for always treating him like a shaman. And so he, he took the opportunity to get his revenge on him in that case. But now he has been elevated in rank and he is still the advisor to the vizier, except it's the new vizier. What is next in the life of Motzeroth? A truth, an arcane truth. Fundamental and forgotten pieces of knowledge found in old libraries, crumbling ruins, whispered by demons, etc. You keep the truths with you when you draw them and it provides a plus one to challenges of the same nature. So now, because I've uncovered this truth and we're about to find out what that is, I get plus one to all arcane challenges. That is very, very good to know. The Ace of Spades. A truth of all realities that gives you power over death and places you above all mortals, giving you a chance at immortality. Well, this is the thing that a lich wants to find, obviously. Where do you find it? Where do you find this incredible truth? In the future constellation of stars, as revealed by an artifact of an extinct race found within a tomb of unfathomable age. All kinds of good stuff coming here. So a truth found in the stars that's probably connected to Azathoth. This is getting kind of Lovecrafty in here. Oh, that's kind of, yeah. So he found an ancient tomb, probably also somewhere in the desert. This desert holds all kinds of old uh, civilizations, apparently, because I think the Red Waste is an artificial desert. I don't think that it's natural. I think that it maybe was sorceress in origin. Who can say? He found an ancient, uh, like an astrolabe kind of thing. Maybe some of that ancient magic that this, this old civilization used was literally drawn from the constellation. So something called constellation magic. Ooh, maybe that's something I'll have to add to the game world at some point. Anyway, that's where he found this truth, but what is the truth specifically? Only death can give you immortality. Follow a terrible ritual of powerful sorcery in the name of forsaken gods to trap your soul and your body for all eternity. So this lich, once he attains lichhood, will be bound into his own body like a prison. What is next? Years are going by, by the way. Years are going by in the city of Ansharir, now ruled by the new vizier, Ratal. What happens next? An event, an arcane event. Events are good. You sign a contract with a demon in exchange for wondrous knowledge and dark favors. Who shall be this demon? Bal... Balan, the burning. What does the demon ask in return for its treacherous favor and unholy patronage? Murderous blood spilled between brothers in a holy day, stirred by rage and awakened by envy. Wouldn't it be cool if Ratal, the vizier, was in fact the brother of the previous vizier? He couldn't kill him because he was his brother, so we exiled him from the city. But now, years later, Balan the Burning has decided that in order to give Mozaroth what Mozaroth wants, he knows that Mozaroth has a personal connection to both previous vizier and current vizier, and he demands that these two proud rulers battle to the death in a temple 
on a high holy day. And so Mozarath arranges the situation. He arranges the old vizier to be secreted into the city again, only to be ambushed in the temple to some, you know, god of the harvest or something. Knowing that these two hated each other and they wind up killing each other. Ooh, that's cool. Balan is now sated and gives Mozarath what he wants, but it leaves the city without a ruler, as those rulers killed each other. Now, what did he give him in exchange for this? Well, he's the burning, so I think he gave him knowledge of fire magic, like knowledge of the, the elements of fire. Or as we will see in the game that I'm developing for season four, he gave him knowledge of the strand of the elements. Ho ho ho, what does that mean? You will find out in season four. Where he became an advisor to a noble lord, one of the, the vizier. I don't know how to say that. Vizier? V vizier? V v vizier? I'm going to call it vizier.